the uh, okay. <laughs> Let me get. So I'm Alan Lawrence, the uh, the current chairperson of the Fox Valley Group of Sierra Club, and I'm sort of saying I'm current because I'm I'm moving. I'm actually talking to you from Virginia, where I uh, have just recently moved. You might see in the background I've got stacks of boxes and things that uh, are in a disorderly state. We've just gotten here. I still have a house in uh, in Wisconsin and uh, we, we, we need to deal with that. So I'm still a Wisconsinite also. Um, the bit that you might have just seen about the meeting being recorded is um, that we've decided this is an important topic and it's getting recorded and it will later be published on, on YouTube. I'm not sure exactly how the link will be shared out to people, but I know that people who want to see this again or, or have wanted to attend tonight's meeting, but just could not, this will give them another chance to see it. So uh, uh, we are recording it. I guess if you really don't wanna be seen and stuff, just maybe turn your video off and, and, uh, and you at least won't be in there at all. In fact, I don't think that most of our images are going to be shown in any event. Um, okay, so um, first, thank you for joining us and uh, thanks for trying to follow the, uh, the, the instructions on how to attend these meetings. Usually once you know the Zoom link, it is an easy thing, but uh, it's sometimes a little bit tricky to get it and then get our computers going. Um, Part of the etiquette of a Zoom meeting is that unless you need to be talking or plan to be talking soon, that we usually just have our microphones muted and that way we're not getting the noise of dishes clanking or cats or children or something. Uh, it's, it's much easier for everyone to hear. Um, also, you can drop out at any point if you feel like this is just not your meeting and nobody will be the wiser. If you do drop out by accident, uh, just try to follow, find the same Zoom link that got you in in the first place and that should get you right back into here. Uh, and I guess if worst case, uh, you can't get back in, uh, look for the, uh, the link or ask about the link later so you can watch it on, on YouTube later. Okay, well, this is a meeting for which uh, normally I would make a number of, of announcements early on, but you know, we've decided this is an important enough topic, not just to the Fox Valley group of Sierra Club, but indeed the entire state chapter. And we've gotten a lot of help from the chapter in putting this off, including uh, we're using their Zoom license for this. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm keeping my announcements to a very short minimum. Pretty much I've used up my time and I will have some more things to say that are relevant to the Fox Valley group at the end of this, like talking about what's happening next month and other activities and help and stuff that we need. So with this in mind, let me um, uh, read off a, a statement that was given to me to sort of indicate why this is important for us. So today we honor and celebrate the indigenous people of Wisconsin and recognize the lands on which we live and re recreate. The vast history of the Dakota, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee and Potawatomi nations, as well as individual tribes have helped shape Wisconsin to what it is today. And here we are to acknowledge their presence and history, as well as their continued efforts to protect and respect the environment and the lands that we share with them today. And uh, now I guess I would like to introduce, and I've lost my, uh, here we go. Uh, with my full screen, I've sort of lost some of these things here. Um, I wanna introduce the, uh, the three, speakers or panelists that we'll have with us today. Um, Guy uh, Reeder, and he's a traditional Menominee uh, who resides on the Menominee Reservation. He is an executive directory, a director, I'm sorry, of the Menominee Indian Community Organization. 
And uh, I'll just keep it short. Uh, you can fill in more on that. Then there is Dr. Al Geddix, who is the Executive Secretary of the Wisconsin Resources Protection Council, uh, or WRPC, which is a statewide environmental membership organization founded in 1982 to help counter the lack of information about the effects of large-scale metallic uh, sulfide mining in our state's precious water supplies on tourism, on dairy industries, and on the many Native American communities that are located near potential mine sites. And finally, Dave Bluen, a guy that I've known now uh, for a number of years because he is one of our Sierra Club, very active uh, members and leaders. Uh, and um, he wears a number of hats as many active Sierra Club people do. Uh, but for tonight, for today, the hat that he's wearing is he is the state's mining committee chair. He's had that for about 25 years and has worked on metallic mining issues, including the Flambeau mine, the failed Crandon mine. I assume that Dave had something to do with why it has failed and the Kogobic Taconite proposals and the recent successful Oneida County referendum over the Lynn deposit. And he's gonna update our group on the Aquila resources and green light metals and their efforts to develop deposits in Wisconsin. And with that, I'm assuming I've given a satisfactory uh, introduction. And Dave, why don't you take over? And you gotta unmute. All right, thanks, Al. Um, and uh, thanks to Alan and the uh, Fox Valley Group of the club for uh, helping host tonight. Uh, welcome to everyone. And uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm really glad to have both Al Gaddix and uh, Guy Ryder with us uh, on board to, uh, to fill in on uh, organizing around the back 40 proposal. Um, my role uh, tonight is just to give a brief update on what's going on on the Wisconsin side of the mining issues uh, and uh, our connection to the back 40 uh, proposal uh, and then let Alan Guy uh, really fill us in on, on all things back 40. Um, I do wanna note at the outset, uh, the Sierra Club uh, Wisconsin chapters uh, kind of overall policy on metallic mining. Uh, we like the Sierra Club nationally, we're not opposed to all metallic mining proposals, but especially in Wisconsin and, and throughout the Great Lakes, uh, Michigan and Minnesota, uh, the socioeconomic and environmental impacts from these proposals are, are disproportionately concentrated uh, in our, our rural communities and our rural counties where counties where the, uh, where the impacts are felt really uh, 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 strongly. And whether underground or open pit, um, you know, these metallic mining proposals, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> are amongst the largest industrial projects that get proposed in our states uh, in terms of land destruction and habitat loss. Um, and then on top of which our Northern counties are significantly wet. Uh, the, you know, in terms of, of significant wetlands, ground and surface waters uh, that make destructive mining even more problematic. Uh, you know, on top of which uh, there are major air impacts, huge quantities of wastewater discharges uh, into our water bodies, uh, and they all feature uh, permanent storage of acid producing mine waste full of waste metals in dumps uh, that measure in the hundreds of acres. So, you know, as proposals go, they are, are particularly problematic um, uh, in, in the Great Lakes area and especially in Wisconsin. So with that, um, uh, can we start the slides? Thanks, Jadine. Um, so uh, just very, I, again, I wanna just touch on, hopefully every, every, everyone can see this well, uh, touch on a few of the deposits, what we know about them going on in Wisconsin, kind of moving from west to east across the state. Um, uh, I just have a quick update on the Flambeau mine. Um, I'm sure many of you know that the, uh, uh, that mine is now closed, has been for many years, um, but also that it polluted a tributary of the Flambeau River. Uh, and uh, the, the short update on this is the stream uh, that was polluted by the mine, a stream called Stream C is in fact still polluted. 
and is, is still listed on the state's most uh, recent impaired waters list. Uh, and just uh, I, just to let you know, we'll continue to monitor that issue, but um, uh, the uh, there is pollution still at the site. Um, just north uh, east of the Flambeau, uh, closed Flambeau mine is the Lynn deposit in Western Oneida County. Uh, that has been controversial for many, many years. Um, the, uh, the quick update on that is that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the deposit appears to be at least in the short term off the table for any kind of development. Uh, the Sierra Club worked with allies in, uh, in the county a couple of years ago, uh, including the local Protect the Willow River group, to oppose a non-binding referendum to lease and develop Lynn. That was on the ballot uh, in the county there in 2018. And, uh, we had a, an important victory there where county voters strongly voted to reject the referendum. So with that rec referendum, county officials uh, have said that development of Lynn is off the, off the table for the time being. Obviously, uh, we're going to keep an eye on that one as well uh, as uh, the local folks, the Protect the Willow folks up there. Um, the other uh, kind of good news on Oneida County, uh, we did a mining update, I think, uh, about a year ago. Uh, a statewide mining update webinar like this. Uh, and we, I talked then about um, uh, some exploratory drilling that was going on in the southeast corner of Oneida, almost adjacent to uh, the Crandon deposit in Forest County, so straight west of Crandon. So the, the, uh, the site isn't shown on this map, but it was drilled by an exploration company called Badger. And uh, Badger drilled several boreholes there uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, but Badger has since announced that it didn't find much and has since let its state exploration uh, license lapse. So that, that is quite good news. Um, then next up are uh, the reef and bend deposits. And here's where the Wisconsin connection to the back 40 uh, proposal uh, becomes much more important. So uh, the reef deposit is a very small, I'm going to describe these more in detail in a minute, but reef is in Marathon County, uh, east of Wausau. Bend is in Taylor County uh, on the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest Unit, uh, the Medford unit of the National Forest. So uh, the importance here is that Aquila Resources, uh, which just until a few weeks ago owned the back 40, recently sold its interests in Reef and Bend to a new Canadian startup uh, company called Greenlight Metals. So Greenlight Metals is not a mining company, but in, instead is made up of Canadian investors and former Aquila executives. And to make things even more complicated, Aquila was just uh, purchased shortly after selling Reef and Bend uh, to, uh, let me get this right, Oh, it was purchased by a, a, a U.S. mining company called Gold Resources Incorporated, which uh, Al and Guy are going to talk about more a little bit later. Uh, next slide. All right, thanks. I mentioned Reef in Marathon County. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a, 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 a little bit more zoomed out map to make this a little bit easier to see, but um, for folks that know uh, the Wausau area, uh, the Reef deposits uh, are uh, directly east of the city of Wausau by about five miles in the town of Easton. Um, so this is an interesting little um, uh, overhead view of the deposits, if you will, um, there. Um, oh, I should point out too that the, the, this, uh, these particular deposits, uh, the reef deposit, um, are, are quite near the Eau Claire River and the uh, dells of the Eau Claire uh, and the Dells of the Eau Claire uh, State Natural Area. So um, it's a strange uh, deposit. This is, this is primarily gold mineralization. Um, and, and so it's a series of very small but moderately rich gold deposits near the surface uh, with about uh, uh, less than half a million tons uh, of ore overall. So each of these uh, veinlets that are marked in red, I think there's seven of them, um, are, are between 100 and 200 yards long and, and they're quite narrow as you can see. Uh, so we have a lot of questions about how exactly 
uh, a company would mine these. They're, they're relatively shallow. Um, and it's hard to imagine how they would uh, uh, get at uh, this, this gold ore uh, without making a huge mess. Um, the, the ore, because it's such a small deposit, the ore would have to be shipped uh, off site. And when Aquila Resources uh, owned this deposit and controlled it, uh, they basically said straight up that if it was mined, uh, the ore would have to be shipped uh, likely to the back 40 site uh, where, where as proposed, uh, back 40 would have a gold processing circuit. Uh, next slide. Uh, then let's move on to Ben. So this is the other deposit uh, that uh, Aquila uh, recently owned, but has since sold now to this new company. Uh, um, and uh, as I mentioned, Ben is on land on the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest. That's the area outlined there. Uh, the overall map here is Taylor County. Medford is down to the southeast, uh, the very small town of uh, Jump River to the northwest. So um, uh, this is public land, of course. It's, it's on our national forest in Taylor County. Uh, the Federal Bureau of, Ma of Land Management controls uh, most of the surface and all of the minerals uh, with a little bit being held by the Sioux Line Railroad Company. Um, Aquila uh, had leased the mineral rights for, for the deposit there. And then um, uh, those leases are gonna probably have to be transferred now to the new owner of this Greenlight Metals uh, before anything could possibly happen at Bend. Uh, next slide. And then I zoomed in um, a little bit closer here. Uh, these are the four 40 acre parcels. Uh, Bend uh, runs across the Northwest 40 um, into the Northeast 40. Um, and I, I zoomed in on this one just to show uh, its proximity to the North Fork of the Yellow River. So that's the North Fork of the Yellow River that's uh, coming in from the east on the Northeast side uh, and going down along the West side. Uh, the known part of the ore body uh, closest to the surface is within about 300 yards, I believe, of the river, and the underground portion of the ore body goes even closer to the river. Um, so it's, you know, it's clearly important, uh, close to an important water source. Um, from here, the Yellow River flows uh, down through the Chihuahuagan Waters flowage. It's also known as the Miller Dam Lake, uh, and then onto Lake Wissota, Chippewa Falls, and into the Chippewa River. Um, this deposit is quite a bit bigger than reef that I just mentioned. This thing is uh, somewhere between three and four million tons, of, but not very, not very high grade ore. Um, and so it's unclear if this uh, also is rich enough for uh, a processing plant to be built on the site or not. Um, Aquila, when it owned, uh, when it, I'm sorry, when it controlled this uh, deposit, because it doesn't own any of it, this is uh, these minerals belong to the public, they belong to us, as does the land there. Um, but when they controlled it, uh, they did speculate that ore could possibly, uh, if mined here, could be shipped up to back 40 for processing as well. Uh, again, with a new, uh, a new uh, company controlling this, uh, we don't know anything more about their plans uh, than that. Oh, and then I, and then I did want to mention, um, and I don't know if anybody has this, uh, anybody from our staff has this ready to go to put in the chat box, but uh, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission um, uh, uh, built a beautiful online story map with a lot more information about the bend, uh, including uh, other areas that, that Aquila had done exploration uh, on the National Forest around Bend. Um, but it's a really cool uh, online story map using uh, GIS mapping and photos and maps uh, and, and as well narrative and a timeline uh, giving a lot more information about uh, uh, about Ben. Oh, thank you, Katie. So that, that should show up in the chat box now. Um, so if uh, after the presentation tonight, you get a chance to uh, uh, take a look at that, just uh, maybe copy, copy that URL uh, and uh, take a look. Otherwise, I know we're gonna send out some information after the presentation tonight. And we'll make sure that we include that with it. Um, so that was it for my slides. And I just had a quick paragraph before I hand this off to Al. 
Um, so again, I want to um, uh, thank everybody for being here. Um, just to wrap up, I, you know, when I think about what's going on in, on the Wisconsin side of everything, uh, it's a little bit of a mix of good news and bad news. So, you know, the bad news is that green light metals may have bought uh, Aquila's interest in Bend and Reef, uh, but this uh, uh, new owner is partially owned by Gold Resources, the new owner of the Back 40 proposal. Um, the good news is that this new company, Greenlight Metals, is unlikely to propose mining anytime soon since the company has few re resources and, as I mentioned before, isn't even an actual mining company. Uh, it's just a, a group of Canadian investors and some of the executives that previously were at Aquila. Um, plus, those same Aquila executives now with Greenlight, uh, most of these are the same executives that all but drove Aquila into bankruptcy. Uh, while failing to get permits uh, at back 40. And I know Alice especially is going to talk about this in a minute. So uh, nonetheless, you know, the future of metallic sulfide mining in Wisconsin uh, appears to be tied uh, pretty distinctly to the future success or failure of, of the back 40 proposal. Um, so with that, I want to pitch it over to Al um, and thank again, Al, uh, especially for uh, being here to help uh, bring us up to date. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, and just a footnote uh, for those who may not be aware, uh, Dave and I worked uh, for many years uh, opposing the uh, Crandon mine at the headwaters of the Wolf River and, and also on the landmark uh, mining moratorium legislation, uh, which up until uh, two years ago uh, was a, uh, a gold standard for protecting uh, the water supply um, of Wisconsin uh, from the dangers of metallic sulfide mining. Uh, so with that uh, as a footnote, uh, let me delve directly into the uh, Back 40 uh, controversy. Uh, the fir first thing to know about the, the Back 40 project um, is that it is nowhere uh, near the size of a, a Back 40. Uh, the, in other words, the, the entire terminology of this project uh, a large scale uh, metallic sulfide mine, uh, about 150 feet uh, from the Menominee River, which is the border between Wisconsin and Michigan, um, is one of the largest proposed uh, open pit combined, open pit and underground mine um, in the upper Midwest, particularly on uh, the border between Michigan um, and Wisconsin. Uh, the, uh, if we can go to the first slide of the, uh, uh, of the pit. Uh, this is an artist conception um, of uh, what an open pit uh, would look like if there were to be a permitted mine. And just so we're clear, there is no uh, mine right now. Uh, the permits uh, that have been uh, advanced over the last 20 years all have been either overturned or withdrawn uh, by the proponent of the, uh, of the company, uh, Aquila Resources of Canada. Uh, but you get some sense of the large scale uh, dimension of this project uh, by this artist conception. Uh, you also get a sense of how close this open pit is to the Menominee River, uh, less than 150 feet from the edge of the Menominee River, which means that any uh, uh, expected discharges uh, from the open pit plus the underground mine operation uh, would directly go into the Menominee River uh, gradually, um, or in a worst case scenario, uh, if there's a catastrophic release uh, of mine waste uh, from the open pit and underground, uh, it would be a, a massive disaster for both the Menominee River as well as all the communities downstream. Uh, the actual dimensions of the open pit uh, would be 2,000 feet wide, 2,500 feet long, and 750 feet deep. Uh, that means uh, that that deep pit uh, would be the equivalent of 57 story skyscraper. Uh, the other important uh, fact about the uh, Back 40 uh, proposed mine is that while the company describes it as a gold and zinc mine, uh, the more accurate characterization of the mine um, is that it is um, a sulfide mine 
with minute quantities of gold and zinc. Uh, because if you take a ton of rock out of this proposed mine, 98% of that rock uh, will end up as waste material. Uh, less than 2% uh, would yield valuable uh, gold or zinc. Uh, the vast majority of the rock, in other words, ends up as waste. Uh, there are uh, projections of 70, uh, 70 uh, uh, tons of mine waste for every ounce of gold that is extracted. Uh, so for a ton of rock, 2,000 pounds, 1,998 pounds ends up as waste material. And that waste material, because it is mixed, with sulfide minerals like pyrite, uh, when those uh, materials are blasted out of the earth, they're crushed and exposed to air and water. Uh, the chemical reaction produces sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid releases heavy metals in a process known as acid mine drainage. Uh, that acid mine drainage mobilizes uh, very, uh, very toxic metals uh, like arsenic, mercury, lead, um, and cyanide, cyanide being one of the chemicals used um, in the processing of the ores uh, to extract the gold from the waste rock. The, uh, the, the uh, waste material, uh, which in the case of the Back 40 project, which composes the majority of the material coming out of the proposed mine, uh, would encompass 70 million tons um, of wa waste rock and milled tailings. tailings are the waste material that is the end result of the crushing and the chemical processing of the ores to extract the valuable gold and the zinc. Uh, those tailings, uh, if you look at the, at the map or the, the, the design of the, uh, the open pit, uh, all that green to the right of the open pit, uh, that would all be cleared land to make way for a massive uh, tailings dam uh, that would be the largest uh, engineered structure on the site of the proposed mine. Uh, that uh, engineered structure is known as a tailings dam. Uh, the tailings dam would be composed precisely of the crushed rock that comes out of the, the milling process um, and is piled up against uh, the edge of the, uh, of the structure. Uh, the height of that structure would be about uh, uh, over 100, uh, 100 feet high, uh, actually 130 feet high to be exact, uh, it would encompass a large area of 123 acres or the equivalent of 100 football fields. Uh, the design of the tailings containment area uh, utilizes a, uh, a design called the upstream tailings dam design, which is essentially a series of layers of uh, crushed waste material that comes out of the mill piled one on top of the other. It is not constructed all at once. It is constructed over time. Um, and by the end of that process, uh, you have a, a large uh, dam structure that is composed of very fine grain material that has the consistency of talcum powder uh, that is extremely unstable and that this particular design, known as the upstream tailings design, um, has the highest rate of worldwide failure uh, where the liquefaction of the, uh, of the water, of, of, the, uh, of the fluids that come out of the tailings, uh, tailings uh, processing operation combined with the fine grain material uh, frequently lend themselves uh, to a liquefied state in a very short period of time, especially under conditions of heavy rainfall and the extreme climate events uh, that are part of the, the new normal um, under global warming. Uh, one, so one of the consequences um, of the combined acid generation plus the large expanse of waste material right next to the open pit in these tailings dams creates the possibility of either gradual or catastrophic discharge of waste material into the Menominee River. Uh, if we can go to the second slide. All right, what you see in front of you um, is the aftermath um, of a uh, acid mine drainage catastrophe 
uh, that occurred in, Col in Colorado in an abandoned gold mine that had been shut down for decades, uh, but had not been reclaimed. Um, and part of the uh, reclamation effort that the Environmental Protection Agency undertook in 2015 uh, accidentally opened up um, a reservoir of acid drainage that was released suddenly into the Animas River where these kayakers had, al had already entered into the river prior to the, the discharge. Um, and what, what happened was uh, some 3 million gallons of toxic wastes were released uh, when, this, uh, when this opening for the abandoned mine released all this uh, acid mine drainage uh, that provided an immediate source of, of danger to the kayakers. If those, because the, the composition of this acid drainage uh, has the, uh, the qualities of battery acid. So if any of those kayakers had dipped their hand um, into the river, either on purpose or accidentally, uh, the skin on their hands would have been ripped off them because of the heavy uh, corrosiveness of the acid um, in that acid mine drainage. And of course, this was not simply a local problem. Uh, this acid mine drainage uh, discharge threatened communities downstream on the Animas River for over 100 miles, extending into Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, in the Navajo Nation, um, um, and particularly in, in the Navajo Nation that depended upon the river uh, for their drinking water and their irrigation. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency um, has uh, surveyed the dangers of uh, abandoned mines creating this continual uh, threat of acid mine drainage and concluded that 40% of all the watersheds in the Western United States have been contaminated by acid mine drainage, which means that these are effectively biological dead zones. No aquatic life exists in these areas where, where they have been subjected to acid mine drainage. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So to give you a sense of the problem of the back 40 mine, um, it is, as I said, on the border of uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, and as you see in the slide, uh, the Menominee River uh, goes down through Green Bay, eventually discharges into the Bay of Green Bay and Lake Michigan. And so any discharge of acid mine drainage or catastrophic release of tailings, uh, 70 million tons of these, uh, of, these, uh, of these finely ground wastes that could be discharged into the Menominee River uh, would pollute all the communities downstream um, on the Menominee River, including the drinking water supply for the city of Menominee, Michigan, and Marinette, Wisconsin, um, and eventually discharge into Lake Michigan, uh, which is the source of uh, commerce, recreation, um, and drinking water for over 10 million people in Lake Michigan and over 40 million people as part of the Great Lakes which are connected uh, between Lake Michigan and the other Great Lakes. Um, and of course, the other uh, significant impact of this mine, um, as Guy will talk about uh, in shortly, um, is that it is on the traditional land um, of the Menominee Nation uh, before the Menominee uh, were forcibly removed uh, from their homeland in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan around the Menominee River. That's why the Menominee River is called the Menominee River. That's why the city of Menominee is called Menominee. Uh, their traditional sites uh, were located at the headwaters of the Menominee River, which is also their origin story uh, for the, uh, the identity of the Menominee people. Um, those areas, those sacred sites, uh, those raised garden beds, uh, those burial sites would also be directly impacted by any sudden discharge uh, of contaminated water or uh, tailings from any disaster at the headwaters of the, uh, of the Menominee River. Uh, next slide. So uh, the, the coincidence between uh, the, the effects of the proposed mine on the water of the Menominee River, plus the groundwater and wetlands 
uh, plus the impact on sacred sites of the Menominee Nation, has brought together uh, these unlikely allies, uh, the Menominee Nation and the citizens, the grassroots uh, organization called the uh, save, save, save the Menominee uh, a co Coalition to Save the Menominee River um, in an effort uh, to educate not only the local community, but all the downstream communities uh, about the dangers of metallic sulfide mining at the headwaters of the Menominee River. And I should also add, uh, as we're talking about the, the coalition between the Menominee Nation um, and the coalition to save the Menominee River, um, is that the uh, Coalition to Save the Menominee River has an active campaign uh, where people can go to the website of the of the coalition, uh, join the Menominee River Coalition org, and there's a button at the top of the website where people can express their opposition to the regulatory authorities in Michigan allowing this dangerous upstream dam design to be part of the permit process. Already there have been 600 letters uh, sent to the authorities in Michigan uh, to inform them uh, that this is a uh, this is an irresponsible action to allow a dam design which has a record of failure all around the world to be permitted in the state of Michigan. Uh, this kind of coalition has resulted um, in, well, in this particular picture that you see in front of you. Uh, this was the day that the Menominee County Board, which is the headquarters of Aquila Resources um, in the local community, uh, the county board passed a resolution against the, against the proposed Back 40 mine. So in the very community uh, which has the most uh, direct stake in the, uh, the permitting of the mine, uh, the local community has expressed its opposition uh, to the project. Next slide. What you see in front of you um, in green are all those downstream counties from uh, uh, Menominee River in, 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 on the, uh, web, on the uh, verge of the proposed Back 40 Mine, uh, all the way down to Green Bay. All those counties in green have passed resolutions against the mining project, against the proposed Back 40 project. Because despite the, the political composition of these communities, uh, which are not all uh, environmentally oriented or for that matter, uh, democratic uh, voting communities, uh, those communities understand that water is a nonpartisan issue and that the contamination uh, of the Menominee River downstream uh, would affect uh, the economy, the culture, um, and the drinking water um, of those communities that depend on the Menominee River. And so all those communities, there are seven communities in uh, uh, on the Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, uh, well, well, primarily in, uh, in Wisconsin and, and one in Menominee plus 12 tribes in Michigan um, and, uh, and, 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 and about 10 tribes in, with 11, actually 11 tribes in Wisconsin that have all passed resolutions uh, against the proposed Back 40 mine. And what this illustrates um, is that regardless of what goes on um, in the permitting process, there is a lack of a social license to operate as evidenced by the resolutions against the mining project. This notion of a social license to operate means uh, that even if there were permits to be granted and they have not yet been granted, uh, it would not guarantee that this line could go ahead because of all this local grassroots opposition that has an impact upon how investors view the riskiness of these projects. And wherever you have large numbers of communities that go on record opposing the project, uh, there is a financial risk to the project uh, that investors take into account uh, when they make decisions about going ahead with the permitting process. Uh, next slide. All right, what, what you see in front of you is the, uh, the open, open pit um, of the Empire Iron Mine um, in Michigan. And I, I, I show this just to give you some sense um, of the, the, the scale of a large scale open pit um, operation, because what this illustrates um, is that if you look beyond the edge of the op open pit and imagine beyond the open pit, 
um, or water rich uh, layers uh, of aquifer uh, that discharge water into the open pit. That is what is exactly what is at stake with the Back 40 project. Um, and the reason that the Back 40 project is on hold uh, is because the wetlands that surround the Back 40 project uh, were not adequately characterized as being at risk by the Aquila, uh, Res Aquila Resource Corporation when they submitted their information on their wetlands permit. Um, and what happens when you have an open pit next to a water resource uh, like the edge of the Menominee River is that all that water uh, that is surrounding the mine pit discharges into the pit and has to be dewatered. Otherwise, you can't have an operation going to excavate the open pit. And what you have then is the, uh, uh, the de uh, a process known as dewatering, which lowers the water table around the open pit to the point where it drains the wetlands and essentially creates a cone, what is known as a, a cone of depression, which lowers the water table and drains the wetlands and exacerbates all of the loss of wetlands around the open pit. That was what was not characterized accurately by Aquila, and that was why uh, the, the wetland permit was denied uh, by a judge hearing the case uh, that was brought by the Menominee tribe and the coalition to save the Menominee River. Um, and in and January 2021, uh, the judge denied the wetland permit. And as soon as that happened, uh, there was a domino effect uh, because all the information that was part of the wetland permit application that was scientifically invalid was also uh, invalid for other parts of the permit operation. And rather than contest uh, the, other, the other permits that had already been granted, Aquila withdrew those other permits um, and also admitted uh, that their application did not take into account the underground part of the operation. In other words, they had only submitted a permit for the open pit part of the operation. They ignored all the impacts from an underground mining operation. And so uh, all of the permits uh, for the mine um, have been either withdrawn or overturned. And what, what that has done is it has brought Aquila to the verge of bankruptcy uh, where they can no longer afford to continue a new permitting process which would be required um, if they were to pursue this project. Um, and because they do not have the funds to continue with the permitting process, process uh, they, have, uh, they have offered for sale uh, their, their asset, the Back 40 project, to a gold mining corporation called the Gold Resource Corporation in, 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 uh, in Colorado, uh, which has decided uh, that it would not be a problem getting permits in, uh, in, in uh, Michigan because the company that is Aquila Resources has mistakenly or, or, or inaccurately conveyed to Gold Resource Corporation that they at one point had all the permits. They never had all the permits. Um, and in fact, uh, the permits that they did have had many conditions attached to them, uh, which made those permits temporary permits until they met those conditions. And so the, the bottom line regarding the future of the Back 40 mine um, is that uh, over the course of 18 years, which has been the timeline from the discovery of this deposit until now, uh, the company has invested over $100 million into getting permits for the mine. They have failed to get those permits. And while they have failed to get the permits, uh, there has been a, a growing opposition uh, led by the Menominee Indian tribe and by uh, the uh, coalition to save the Menominee River, which has brought this permitting process to a halt and which is ready to continue their opposition to any renewal of a permitting process by a company that mistakenly believes that getting new permits is going to be an easy process. Let me stop there and uh, we can get into further discussion um, in the question and answer period.
So, hi all, this is uh, Dave Bluen again. I think we've lost our moderator, uh, Katie. Um, oh, I am right here. I thought we were going to, did Guy have a slide or two? Yeah, yeah thanks. Okay. Let's do that, please. Yeah, for so. Um, on a quit net cam, while Pasha net to tem kashidna and it's you wake in. Why when and my own way of Kayo Saitua? My English name is Guy Ryder, but my real name is uh, Onaquit. And uh, um, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit located here on the Menominee Indian Reservation. <clears throat> um, before I get into anything, I, I wanted to just <laughs> um, mention that that, that slide that. Uh, Al Geddick's head up where we were all standing outside of that building uh, brings back a lot of memories. But one of the funnier things about that time is the, the meeting prior, um, Aquila had brought in all these miners from, from uh, uh, up by Marquette and they all had green shirts on and they all sat in those uh, meetings with us. And then we knew when we were gonna go to this meeting that um, they were gonna be there. So we had everybody wear blue shirts and we got there like an hour early because they, they made us line up to get in there. And I knew the capacity of that building. So I made sure that we have enough people to fill that, that place up and, and uh, those guys wouldn't be able to get in. But I have this beautiful pho photograph of all of us that have gotten in there. Like there, none of those green shirts got in there. There were some of them that were looking in the windows, you know, at us as trying to, trying to see what we were doing. And I, man, it was such a, such a blast. Um, <clears throat> So kind of, uh, you know, what Al had, had said, you know, the, the cultural significance, you know, of that river in our language, you know, that, that river they call Minikani Sepe in our language. And, um, you know, it is, is the very birthplace of our, of our people. And I brought this map up um, because that, that beautiful um, bear that is there was done by uh, one of our uh, elders, an artist, uh, is no longer here. Uh, Mr. Frechette, uh, James Frechette. Um, it's in our actual museum right now here on the on the Menominee Indian Reservation. But it's the representation of uh, our oral history that states that, uh, you know, we come from the mouth of that Menominee uh, River, Minnikani Sepe, that um, all other tribes, you know, have um, they have stories of, of where they come from, uh, migration stories, and, and uh, our stories start right there, the mouth of that beautiful river. So we've been there for a very, 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 very long time. We've been in this area for a very long time. As you can see with the picture in the middle, you can see that uh, all of those uh, different colored tracts of land on the state of Wisconsin are, are different treaties, you know, that we were kind of swindled into and, and um, you know, gave more and more of our land away. But uh, it does show our current reservation where we are. It's that little black box. I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but um, that's where we currently are. You know, we're not in that red star is, is where the back 40 mine is. So we're not very far. I think it's about 40 miles by the way the crow flies. Um, but uh, I wanted to just, uh, you know, talk about um, when this whole thing kind of began um, you know, it, it was at the time it was just an organization by the name of uh, Front Forty. They they kind of had a play on the Back Forty. They they called themselves the Front Forty because they wanted to be upfront about things. And the, the gentleman that I had met, his name is uh, Ron Henricks, and, and uh, he was the the executive director uh, of that uh, organization. And they were the only ones really doing anything in opposition to to Aquila. Um, and, uh, I don't even, we got, on, I don't even know how I got his phone number, but we got, we got on a phone, I got on a phone call with him when I kind of, uh, found out and, um, we had this big, long talk, he invited me up to their next meeting. Um, that was in, uh, well, I think it was in Wasaki, I think is where they met somewhere like that. Anyway, and I went up there and, um, sat through that meeting and, you know, they were, they were uh, happy to see me, um. I didn't really know what to expect, but I was uh, 
I was really uh, greeted with warm, warm well wishes, and I, I really appreciated that. So uh, after that meeting, you know, me and Ron, we had a talk about it, and you know, I got pretty fired up about it, and and uh, came back home here onto the reservation, and and I remember uh, specifically going to one of our uh, ceremonies because I figured uh, I wanted to just think about this, you know, and think about like what we should do or what I should do, and. I remember uh, being at that ceremony and after we were all done, I remember talking to one of my uncles there and I was telling him about this, you know, and I was telling him, you know, somebody should be, you know, attending these meetings, you know, somebody should be writing letters, somebody should be putting us on the emails and somebody should be doing this and somebody should be doing that. And, you know, he hit me right between the eyes and said, well, you know, you're somebody. And I, and I thought, oh man, that, that's true. I am. I am somebody. So you know, from that moment on, you know, I, I just took it upon myself to do whatever I can to get the word out. And definitely went in front of the tribe and the tribe um, jumped right on board. I mean, this is, you know, a, a place of our our beginning, you know, it's the, the center of our universe. So they were definitely uh, on board immediately. And we started to plan and strategize. And, you know, one of the very first people I believe we called was Mr. Al Geddix, um, you know, and, and uh, I remember too that there was a a group in Michigan. They walked with us when we did a, um, a walk. I don't know if they were a group yet, but they were just starting. And that was Regina Chaltry and Nick Veith, Tony Corey. I think Mary Hansen was there. Uh, Jeff Budish. Um, there was just a, a lot of folks there. There, some of them might be on this this call as well. And um, you know, they were right with us when we took our water walk and we walked from our reservation up to that mine site. Um, you know, it was about 126 miles. <laughs> so it was like um, really, really good allyship uh, right from the get go. And uh, I think everybody kind of knew their lane. I think we all understood that, you know, the tribe holds the big stick in this fight. And, you know, let's try to follow what they're going to do. And, and, you know, they can open doors that we just can't do. Um, so, so we strategized and did everything like that. We, we created a, uh, a speaking tour um, where we just, you know, went everywhere. And, and uh, Dr. Geddix and I and, and others, we just were all crisscrossing all over the state. I think it was just a, a whole lot of speeches on the back 40 we gave um, in, those, in those early days. And uh, <clears throat> that really helped to get the word out. And, and we focused uh, predominantly on, well, anybody that would be willing to listen to us, but we predominantly focused on um, uh, universities, thinking that we would encourage our young people to, to get involved and uh, which, they, which they did, you know, there was quite a few of them that have walked and, and done lots of things to help us out along the way and are still continuing to help. Um, so, you know, we did that speaking tour and, and um, it created quite a buzz and, and got a lot of people to the table. Um, you know, and we just kind of did everything we could and then that, that whole uh, ordeal was part of our strategy about getting resolutions passed. Um, not, not, not to like, that the resolutions don't hold a lot of teeth, but they're a beautiful visual when you put them up on there and you say that all these counties, you know, voted against this particular mine. And uh, it was a pretty easy sell too. I don't think that, uh, you know, there was much opposition even in Menominee County in Michigan, there wasn't a big opposition to it. So it was, it was pretty awesome um, to see and, and uh, you know, we put our heart and soul into this and, and, you know, we're still at it, you know, we haven't gone anywhere. We're still meeting quite regularly on uh, telephone and, and still, you know, keeping this alive and keeping an eye on things and, and being a thorn and eagle and Aquila's uh, side for sure. Um, but the other thing I, I wanted to also mention is not only like the, the known burial, burial grounds, uh, which you can see in the, the bottom uh, right picture, um, is one of the our, our burial mounds. You know, the, there's three sets of them there. Um, there's been bodies taken out of there. We've had some of those bodies out of that one particular that you're looking at. Um, I don't know how um, far back. Uh, oh man, about maybe four or five years ago, they we got those uh, relatives back um, home here, and we reburied them here on our reservation. And I think there was 21. 21 bodies that they took out of that mound at that time. So that was a, you know, like that was a big moment for all of us here 
um, just to be able to sit with our ancestors that like physically lived on that that uh, land for thousands and thousands of years. And, um, you know, the other thing too is, is what we found out is how important the sturgeon uh, are to the Menominee River, you know, that uh, the sturgeon are, are kind of like um, salmon in the sense that they, they go home to their home rivers to, to spawn. And uh, I believe the number is about 80% of the, the uh, Lake Michigan um, sturgeon use the Menominee River. To, to spawn and, and uh, the, that's one of the big reasons why there are uh, two um, uh, sturgeon fish ladders there and uh, at, at a couple dams that are that are on the river and um, you know we toured those areas too and, and this this time that we were there one time we had the tribe there and we were invited to, to see the sturgeon ladder in action and everything and you know it was I think it was maybe um, midsummer we were there or, or towards the fall and and you know, at that time, you know, the sturgeon are usually in the lake. And when we, when we were there, one, one came in there for us. And, you know, it was such a powerful moment for us because sturgeon for us, in our language, we call it namau. And, and uh, that roughly translates to like the prehistoric fish are the, the very first ones, you know, we recognize the, the antiquity of that fish. You know, you know, the words we call ourselves is kayas mamache talak. And that kind of roughly means, you know, like the, the first peoples are, are um, you know, the ancient ones, you know, that's, that's kind of the way we see ourselves. So we have that connection with that beautiful sturgeon. And it was a moment to see that there in that, in that dam when it came there, because it was, it was so beautiful. And it, and it also kind of made us think that, yeah, we're doing the right thing and we we'll just keep, we we'll keep pushing. So, you know, I could probably go on and on about this and, and uh, talk about little things that we did here and there, but, you know, I, I just, you know, would really um, thank all those ones that are on this call and, and the ones that aren't that, that really help, helped us and, and uh, push this forward and, and stand shoulder to shoulder with us. You know, Dave Blue and I, you know, ran into him pretty early on in this fight. And, you know, he was very accommodating and helping us out to try to figure out, you know, these scientific terms. And, you know, he's been involved in mining for a very long time. So I was always really, you know, honored um, to, to, to get such an open door, you know, to, to our movement and what we were trying to do and standing with our, our relatives. And, you know, we've tried to help out other organizations, you know, when, when we were fighting uh, this back 40 mine, like in the, just the just, uh, you know, beginning of it, you know, Standing Rock jumped off and, and uh, you know, we were still fighting here. So trying to be supportive to two, to, to Standing Rock and also here, and uh, we carried, uh, when we walked up that river for that, that water walk, we carried some of that, that water from Standing Rock with our, our uh, Wolf River uh, water from our reservation. And then we joined those two, two waters right into the Menominee River. And, you know, it was such a beautiful time. And, you know, for people that um, don't understand or, or, you know, don't know um, too much about, you know, our cultural ways, those moments, you know, will be with me forever. And they're so, so important. You know that we did the took the time to do those things, and um, you know it's been such an, an honor to do this. And I feel like I could ramble on and on, uh, but but I'm gonna stop it there, and we can always dig into more with the Q and A if if uh, there's questions. But again, you know, I just want to thank everybody that that put their time and energy and and heart and soul into this, and uh, I'm really appreciative. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. And a huge thank you if you want to put something in the chat to all of our speakers, to Dave, to Guy, to Al, for taking the time to speak to so much of us. You know, I've been working with the Wisconsin chapter for a couple of years now, and I still haven't uh, gotten hands on with this work yet. So it's really incredible what you guys have, have done and really, and really created. And tonight I'm here to moderate a little bit of a Q&A. And we had a question when you all RSVP to submit questions to our panel and by and large, the most frequently asked question from people all over the state was, how can we help? How can, how can I in Madison, how can I in Milwaukee, how can we help and make sure that these destructive mining projects aren't, are, are continue to, to be halted and not come to fruition? I'll take a first shot at that. Uh, as I said in my initial presentation, uh, there's an ongoing campaign uh, of 
uh, pressure on the uh, Department of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy uh, to express public opposition uh, to the consideration um, of, an, of a the so-called upstream dam design, uh, which is the same dam design that resulted in the catastrophic failure of a large tailings dam in Brazil in uh, January 2019 that killed 270 people who were literally buried alive uh, from the waste material that came out of that, that dam. Um, and the, uh, of course, the uh, Brazilian government um, after that and, and uh, a previous uh, Dale Tellings Dam disaster uh, banned the upstream dam design uh, from, any further, from any further construction of new uh, mining projects. Uh, other countries that have banned the upstream dam design include uh, Chile, Peru, and Ecuador. Um, and the uh, latest information on, the, on those uh, dam designs has come out of a group called Earthworks in uh, Washington, D.C. and Mining Watch Canada, uh, which have compiled a list of over 100 scientists and grassroots nonprofit organizations um, and uh, uh, native rights organizations uh, that have uh, recommended that this design be banned uh, as any kind of uh, any kind of permitting uh, pro uh, process for the back 40 project. And as I said, there are over 600 letters that have already been sent uh, to the uh, Michigan uh, Great Lakes uh, and Energy Department uh, asking them uh, to not consider this dam design uh, when and if there is a new permit process initiated uh, by Gold Resources Corporation. And let me just uh, emphasize uh, that when these letters are received by these regulatory agencies, uh, they do have an impact. Uh, and we know that that is the case because when the wetlands permit was being challenged uh, in a contested case hearing, uh, the people from the uh, Department of Environmental Quality, uh, which was the regulatory agency that handled uh, the wetlands permit, uh, they testified that over 3,000 comments have been submitted to the state by the public uh, against the uh, uh, permitting of a mine that would destroy all those wetlands. And so the agencies understand uh, that public opposition plays a very important role in their decision making about the mine permit um, and the uh, the, the thoroughness of the review that they have to perform because they know that there are thousands of people watching this process and those thousands of people uh, will, will not tolerate any kind of uh, misinformation being used as a basis for granting a permit uh, for a mine that has this kind of destructive potential. Well, I got a question in the chat and I'm realizing I don't know the answer. Do we have an address for that department name, a, a place I can direct folks to, to go all to take have, action there? All you have to do um, is go to jointheriverCoalition.org. Uh, Join the River Coalition is all one word, dot org. Um, and the first, uh, the first button or the second button on the top of the page will direct you uh, how to send a letter to the uh, Michigan Department of Great, of, uh, of, uh, Great Lakes Energy and Environment, uh, asking them to not consider the permitting of an upstream dam design. And you can add your own personal comment as well uh, if, you have if you have specific personal concerns about the potential impact of a spill of this magnitude on the Menominee River and the water resources uh, downstream uh, into Lake Michigan. Yeah, the, the thing too that, you know, I would like to add is, is that, you know, <clears throat> kind of through this process, there's some things that really come pretty clear to, to how people can help and, and understand um, what to do. I think one is, is vote, you know, we have to, we have to take uh, a part in our, our democratic process and, and be informed and, and make good decisions. 
so we have the right uh, representatives that you know uh, represent us in, in our our uh, um, ideas. Um, so that that one is is for sure. And I think the other thing is to just to educate our, ourselves on on things that are going on in the in the the uh, state, um, seeing that there are potential uh, mines coming or or other things that that are. Um, you know, detrimental to our, our beautiful sacred water and, and our, our natural world. Um, the other thing too is, is something that's always stuck with me and, and uh, you know, that, that what Al, um, Dr. Geddix had talked about earlier, you know, is that prove it first law, um, you know, the mining moratorium, that thing, you know, was the pride and joy of a lot of us. You know, I, I know quite a few of us that have been in the environmental game for a long time. You know, it, it the way it was done, you know, so quickly by uh, Mr. Tom Tiffany and his uh, cronies, you know, in a matter of months, they were able to to pull that out and they were holding, they were doing everything politically to, to get that, uh, um, you know, overturned. <laughs> but there, there's one thing I wanted to talk about is, is you know, realizing that these these laws that are in place right now, you know, these so they say the water clean water act and, and these environmental laws, you know, that that like they're developed for the environment, but they're actually not. You know, they're they're developed for for businesses and mining companies and extraction companies to do exactly what they're doing, right? We wouldn't be in the situation right now if um, you know these mining companies or if these laws were were written in a way that understood a, the way in which we understand nature. So there's opportunities that we've been um, diving pretty heavily into and uh, working on some rights of nature. You know, I'm proud, proud to say that our, our uh, Menominee Nation back in 2020 passed a resolution recognizing the rights of the Menominee River. Um, these these uh, uh, movements in, in like I said, the resolutions don't have a lot of bite, but what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to get into every county and, and municipality. Hopefully we can get a state constitution change of, of recognizing that our, our waters and our lands have rights and that you can't just go in there and, and destroy them and pollute them and there's there's no repercussions or we're left holding the bag, you know, things like that. So that's some of the stuff too um, that'll be coming out soon. And, and I'm sure a lot of you here on this call are aware of that. Um, but I just wanted to, to also add that. Thank you so much. Dave, do you have anything to add to, to that question? Or I can pose another one. <laughs> Uh, well, no, just briefly, I, I saw that there was another kind of related question, um, you know, to the whole tailings dam issue, and that was, you know, are there safer designs out there, that sort of thing. Um, and, and there are potentially safer designs, there's something called uh, 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 dry stacking of tailings, makes absolutely zero sense in our climate, which is wet. Um, uh, much of the year, uh, so the, the the concept would be that you 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 drain the water from the tailings uh, to try to reduce the potential that they'll produce acid, uh, because uh, you know uh, adding water uh, to uh, to acidic wastes only produces even more acid. So, but I, I think I'd want to reframe it somewhat, and that's that um, part of the problem with what Aquila proposed was to. Uh, to put together a tailing stam design that is both cheap and easy and was the nearest property uh, to them, which included wetlands destruction, uh, instead of even proposing to, uh, you know, relocate the wastes uh, somewhere in, an, in a, uh, uh, in, um, on higher ground uh, that uh, was farther away from the river that didn't destroy wetlands in the first place. And I'm not even, uh, you, I'm not even mentioning that to suggest that there is potentially a safe design to this mine because it's inherently wrong in the first place uh, due to the resources that it endangers. It's too close to cultural resources um, and it's too close to the river in the first place. So, you know, I don't see that, that this is a feasible uh, or even a reasonable place uh, to mine in the first place. But I, I did want to just address, you know, that, uh, that more responsible companies 
uh, and, and obviously N NGOs like uh, Earthworks and uh, Mining Watch Canada uh, are trying to do their best to get the industry to adopt much better practices. Uh, you know, whether or not we'll see something, you know, uh, better proposed here or elsewhere uh, in the Upper Great Lakes uh, remains to be seen. The companies operate on the cheap and they operate on the fly and they operate with what they think they can get away with. And often the regulations are so poorly written. Uh, and I can point, point to multiple loopholes in, in all of our states, Michigan, Minnesota and Wisconsin, uh, that allow them to propose uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the, the least protective designs instead of the most protective designs. Oh, if I can add, uh, the uh, report uh, that came out last year from the uh, Earthworks and Mining Watch Canada uh, not only presented a uh, consensus uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, banning of the upstream tailings dam design, but also propose other guidelines uh, if there is um, a consideration um, of an alternative, uh, alternative ways of disposing of the vast amounts of mine waste that come out of these, these mines. And one of, the, uh, one of the guidelines is that first of all, there'd be uh, total disclosure uh, of what the worst case scenario would be if there were to be a catastrophic release of these tailings. Uh, that means that all the communities that would be impacted have to be identified. Uh, they would have to be informed about uh, their risk uh, of being in the pathway of the, uh, of the uh, tailings uh, discharge. Uh, they would have to be notified of what emergency procedures are in place or not in place uh, if there were to be a, a, a discharge of uh, catastrophic release of tailings, and furthermore, uh, that they be uh, consulted about whether uh, they, they want to take the risk um, of placing their, their homes and their properties um, and their cultural and economic resources uh, in, in the path, pathway of potential contaminants uh, from these uh, proposed large-scale waste disposal facilities or tailings, tailings dams. Um, all of that is to, un to, uh, to underscore the lack of all of these precautions uh, that the state of Michigan has not taken to either inform the communities downstream of the risks they are posing or to consult the communities that would be directly affected, including the Menominee Indian tribe. Um, and not only should the Menominee Indian tribe be consulted about the, uh, the risk of catastrophic release of tailings, but they also ought to be consulted uh, about the harm that would occur uh, if there were uh, uh, activities at the mine site uh, which disrupted or destroyed uh, their sacred sites. Uh, this is part of what would normally be considered uh, federal, over, federal trust responsibility if this mine were to be located in Wisconsin uh, and Wisconsin would be obligated to comply with federal guidelines uh, to have the Menominee tribe be consulted um, on these projects. Because this mine takes place in Michigan, which is a delegated state uh, from the federal government uh, that has oversight of the entire mining permitting process, the state of Michigan has taken the position that they do not need to consult the Menominee tribe, which is a, an insult um, and a violation of their tribal sovereignty. Thank you again for speaking to these really important questions. I think we have time for maybe one or two more and I'm seeing a couple questions in the chat. Uh, something that was submitted in the registration as well as if there are any active lawsuits, any active legislation that people can weigh in on or that we should be watching with you all. The uh, primary lawsuits uh, that challenge the uh, mine permits uh, have already either been resolved uh, in, this, in the sense that the wetland permit was overturned um, and the other contested cases uh, brought by the coalition to save the Menominee River and the Menominee tribe uh, have been withdrawn by the mining company. 
so the, uh, the, the next major hurdle in this process um, would be a re, uh, a re starting of the entire permitting process uh, by the uh, Gold Resource Corporation, which is the company that is now considering uh, the buyout of the killer resources. I'm seeing some hands raised. I would encourage folks to put those questions in the chat. And this is definitely not the end of this discussion. Um, I maybe want to pass it to all three of our panelists now, if you guys have any closing remarks, last things that you would like to share. And then I think after that, we'll turn it back over to Al Lawrence, of the Fox Valley Group to give us some closing remarks. So to our panelists, do you have any last statements to share? Uh, I noticed there's an important question in the chat, uh, which is uh, why this river and this permitting process is not a federal project because it is an interstate water body. Uh, and that, in fact, was one of the lawsuits uh, that was put forward by the Menominee Nation and the Coalition to Save the Menominee River, arguing uh, that precisely because this is an interstate water body, that, that Michigan should not and does not, under the Clean Water Act, have exclusive permitting authority over an interstate water body. Uh, the, the judge in, in that case rejected that, uh, rejected that argument. That argument was then brought to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago and the, circuit, and the appeals court upheld the lower court decision. So we've already litigated that argument. Uh, and one of the ironies um, of, the, uh, of, of the case uh, that was made during the hearings on uh, whether Michigan has sole permitting authority um, is that the court told the, the, the plaintiffs, the Menominee tribe and the coalition, uh, that if they wanted to challenge Michigan's exclusive permitting authority uh, delegated by the federal government, they should have done that in 1984 uh, when the law was changed that allowed Michigan to have exclusive jurisdiction. And of course, this is an absurd argument because in 1984, no one knew that there was going to be a back 40 project. And I can add just a little bit to that too, because uh, the state of Wisconsin comes into play is, is this is a, you know, a boundary water, uh, you know, for our two states. So because of the delegation um, made to the state of Michigan, uh, especially over wastewater uh, permitting. Uh, so there'd be the, the NIPTES, or well, in this case, the MIPTES permit uh, to discharge into the Menominee River. Uh, the state of Wisconsin has, has repeatedly deferred to the state of Michigan um, uh, over the authority to, uh, to actually regulate that discharge. Uh, and uh, our, our state DNR has in fact consulted with state of Michigan and, and apparently have, have made some constructive comments, but they've essentially punted and they've deferred the de decision-making uh, solely to the state of Michigan. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty disappointed with that. Um, and I, I would, um, uh, we're, we're looking into it to see if there is something that we can do to force or, or, or push the state into uh, taking a more proactive approach to it, um, uh, because we know that there are concerns. <clears throat> there are concerns from the from the Wisconsin side, obviously. Yeah, I would also add too that you know with the with the work that we did on the ground in in terms of getting helping people to understand how important it is to get out the vote. You know, we were able to swing both governorships in Michigan and in, in Wisconsin. But, you know, with, with the, the larger uh, administration that's that's at the White House right now, you know, we're we're also, um, you know, being able to, to get um, friendlier and, and more knowledgeable people in the EPA, especially in, the, in a, our district, District 5, you know, where we just, Jesus. I could tell I could write a book on, on, on some of that stuff, but we have a lot more friendly folks there this time. And, and uh, you know, they're not going to be there forever, of course, but, you know, we have them have them there now. And, and uh, it's took a lot of work to, to make some of that happen. So, Katie, I know that we're, we're really running up against time and I know that there's a ton of interest on this. Um, 
is there a way um, for folks to uh, sign up to ask for more information or uh, or will we, we just send out a form uh, to everybody asking if they want to uh, sign up for more information and or ask other questions uh, outside of tonight? Yeah, I actually put together a Google form really quickly. So we will be sending a follow-up email to everybody with all the links that we've shared tonight and this form as well if you're interested in volunteering or learning more information. And I'll go ahead and put that in the chat to be able to, oh, send that to one person directly, send that to everyone. Um, and you can also always reach out to, to me after the follow-up email and ask, hey, where do I go to get more involved or to get more information? And we're happy to, to get that to you all directly. No, oh, that, that's wonderful. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, I know that folks still have lots of questions and, and uh, uh, Guy and Al and I know from all of the presentations we've done over the years, we could spend all night talking about this issue. It, it's so big and um, uh, so complex and it's so important. Um, and so uh, maybe I can help close and, and get us moved on so that Alan can talk a little bit more about what's going on with the, with the Fox Valley group. So um, again, I wanna thank everybody uh, for joining in tonight and, and for your patience uh, and, uh, uh, and sticking with us for as long as you did. I especially wanna uh, thank Al and Guy. Uh, I, I've been so honored to work uh, alongside you guys and to uh, have your guidance and help over the years. Uh, as we've, we've worked through a lot of these projects together and a lot of these issues together. I, I can't tell you how much it means to me. Thank you. Um, uh, and then I don't know if you guys had anything uh, in closing before we pitch it back to Alan. Uh, just a, a final thought. Uh, the, uh, the magnitude of this threat uh, should not discourage anyone uh, from believing uh, that their individual action uh, has uh, direct impact on the outcome of the project. We know this because we've defeated uh, the largest mining corporations in the world at Crandon uh, over a 28-year period, beginning with Exxon and ending with BHP Billiton. BHP Billiton was the is the largest mining corporation in the world, um, and they essentially conceded that they could not overcome the grassroots resistance of a united Indian and environmental coalition that is that is determined to protect native treaty rights and the water resources that we all depend on. Yeah, and I would also add that, you know, like we may have this company on the on the ropes right now, but as long as those minerals are in the ground, it's always going to be somebody looking at them. So we have to be vigilant at all times. All right, Al Lawrence, wanna close us out? Okay, well, first I wanna thank the, everyone who joined in on this thing. And the, the number on the bottom of my screen said there were 95 Zoom connections um, for most of the program. Now that of course included those of us presenting, but it also included a very, very large audience uh, from not only the Fox Valley group, but around the state. and. I don't actually know where everyone came from, but it's a it's an issue of uh, large importance to people. Then I want to thank the uh, the Sierra Club's chapter staff for organizing this thing, facilitating facilitating it, and, and then moderating this thing. Particularly Katie Hogan, who we saw most of the time there, and also Elizabeth Ward and Janine uh, Sedona. Uh, of the chapter. And then thank you to the three presenters, Dave Bluen, Al Gedick, and uh, Guy, or Guy Ritter, um, not only for the presentation, but also for having put up this fight over the years. Uh, those of us who followed this at all have, have seen your faces uh, a number of times over the years. So thank you for putting up the fight and the resistance and educating everybody who will listen, uh, that this is important. Um, I think perhaps this may have already been done, but I know that I was told that 
uh, Dave would have an action item or a call to action for all of us uh, afterwards. And maybe that was just following that link that, that Katie sent out. But uh, I have a couple of announcements for my group before I let us out. First, the uh, December 9 meeting that we have uh, customarily is a holiday party, but this year it won't be because we still have uh, COVID issues that we need to be concerned about. So instead, we are planning a, a regular program, just like we do our other months. I believe that we are going to be learning about uh, the Point Beach nuclear power plant. Uh, everyone can see the invitation when we have it on our uh, events on the bottom of our Sierra Club webpage. Uh, anyone can join and uh, please do, I guess. And then finally, uh, uh, our group, and I'm sure it's true with all Sierra Club groups, need uh, board members or XCOM members. Uh, our group in particular, because I'm uh, technically out of the area and I'm just finishing up my term. So uh, my wife and myself who are members are uh, not going to be uh, on our board next year. So we're a little bit short. Um, so with that, I, I guess I wanna say, please do check our website or at least our members should check our website. And uh, that's where there's always gonna be something, uh, uh, events, uh, possible outings if we have any and so forth. And finally, uh, D David, is there one last thing you wanna say about a follow-up or has it already been covered? Nope, it's actually already been covered again. Uh, and I just wanna uh, thank everyone again for uh, uh, sticking, uh, sticking uh, all the way through to the end. Uh, much appreciation. So thank you everybody.